scripture reading today is from Exodus 6, verses 1 through 9. Then the Lord said to Moses, Now you shall see what I will do to Pharaoh. Indeed, by a mighty hand he will let them go. By a mighty hand he will drive them out of this his land. God also spoke to Moses and said to him, I am the Lord. I appeared to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as God Almighty, but by my name, the Lord, I did not make myself known to them. I also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land in which they resided as aliens. I have also heard the groan groaning of the Israelites, whom the Egyptians are, are holding as slaves, and I have remembered my covenant. Say therefore to the Israelites, I am the Lord, and I will free you from the burdens of the Egyptians and deliver you from slavery to them. I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with mighty acts of judgment. I will take you as my people, and I will be your God. You shall know that I am the Lord your God who has freed you from the burdens of the Egyptians. I will bring you into the land that I swore to give Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I will give it to you for possession. I am the Lord. Moses told this to the Israelites, but they would not listen to Moses because of their broken spirit and their cruel slavery. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, Esther, I got a little bit nervous when you started reading Craddock stories this morning out of that book. I said to myself, I hope she doesn't read the story I've put in the sermon already <laughs> this morning. And then I remembered I didn't have a Craddock story in this morning's, in this morning's uh, sermon. But then I said to myself, if she's going to read Craddock stories, I might as well not preach. Because who wants to hear anything but his stories? It was a, a joy in my life to uh, be a student of Dr. Craddock and to, especially to sit in his uh, preaching classes. Will you pray with me? Let the word of life strike the chord and set the tune for our lives, O God, for we ask it in the name of Christ. Amen. Honoring our... Uh, college uh, graduates this morning and uh, remembering that uh, one of them is, uh, has graduated from Northwest Christian University reminded me of uh, the days that I spent back there at Northwest Christian College in those days. And I got to thinking about the fact that one of my, uh, that one of my most pleasant memories of those uh, days in college comes from the uh, devotional meetings that we used to have each evening in the house where I lived. I lived in a house that is no longer there on the campus called uh, Harmon House. And uh, every evening at 10 o'clock after they locked up the girls in the dormitories, uh, all 60 of us uh, fellows who lived in the uh, Harmon House would gather in that house's large living room for about uh, 20 minutes of uh, singing and praying together and a devotional led by one of the uh, fellows. It occurs to me that there was seldom anything very memorable about those devotionals because we were young and naive and were not very deep thinkers. But the singing, oh, the singing that we could do together you can't believe the sound that 60 young men can make when they throw themselves into singing a, an old-time spiritual. I can almost hear us singing now one of our favorites. It went like this, Oh, freedom, 
Oh, freedom. Oh, freedom over me. And before I'll be a slave, I'll be buried in my grave. Because I ain't going to be here much longer. I suppose that the people who originally sang those words sang them as an act of hope and defiance because the fact of the matter is they were slaves, in body at least. But they sang those words with hope and defiance because they had made up their minds that in their soul, in their mind, in their inward self, they could never, ever be made a slave because they understood that God wills freedom for all people. They understood and sang those words because they knew that God's will for every single person in the world is, is to be free. But the text that we have read this morning reminds us that freedom is a very fragile gift of God. It's a very fragile gift that can so easily be destroyed and that carries with it a good deal of responsibility. And that's why I thought it might be a good thing for us this morning through the reading of the scripture to be reminded again of the major story of freedom in the Hebrew scriptures, the story of the Exodus. We didn't read the whole story this morning. If we'd have read the whole story of the Exodus, we'd be here at all uh, the fireworks start tomorrow. But we read enough of the story for us to be reminded of the way in which that book of Exodus tells us about that great freedom tale. And I suppose that maybe the place for us to begin in thinking about that story is to think about the definition of freedom that comes to us through that Exodus story. It always seems to me that a Fourth of July weekend is a good time for all of us to think about what is our definition of freedom. I wonder how you would define freedom. There are all kinds of definitions out there, you know. Some are better than others. Some people want to define f freedom as the right to do whatever I happen to feel like, whenever I happen to feel like doing it, regardless of the consequences that it brings to others' lives, regardless of the pain that it may bring to others' lives. If you think about it, that's the way in which the Orlando shooter, not too long ago, was thinking about freedom, just believing that he had the right to do whatever he wanted to do, when he wanted to do it, regardless of the pain that it brought to other people's lives. Some people define freedom as the God-given right for me to inflict my will on those who are weaker than me. In that way of thinking, the only people who uh, can have freedom are the strong, the rich, and, the, and those who are powerful, the strong, the rich, and the powerful. That's the way the Egyptian pharaoh thought about uh, freedom. Freedom was only for the strong. That's the way Hitler thought about uh, freedom. As far as he was concerned, only the strong deserved to survive. Only the strong deserved to have freedom. Would that that idea of freedom had died, but it's still present with us and some of our own political leaders want to think that uh, freedom simply means inflicting my will on those who are weaker than, than me. It's a bad way of thinking about freedom. And neither one of those two ways of thinking about freedom is the way in which the Exodus story thinks about freedom. If freedom was uh, the right to do what I want to do when I want to do it, I suppose the exodus would never have happened because 
every Hebrew would have wanted to leave Egypt on his or her own time schedule when it was convenient for them, and they'd have never gotten their act together to go. If freedom is simply a matter of the strong inflicting their will on the weak, the exodus would never have taken place because Pharaoh was so much stronger. The forces of the Egyptians were so much stronger than those of the Hebrew people. No, neither one of those is the definition the uh, Exodus story wants to hold up to us. The Exodus story wants us instead to think of freedom as a common journey toward a goal that will benefit all people. A common journey that will, uh, toward a goal that will benefit all people. And when you think of freedom in that way, if that's the definition we can accept of freedom, moving together toward a common goal that will benefit us all, then there are some things that are demanded of us. For one thing, is to be a journey toward a common goal, then the society has, our society has to be organized so that no voice is lost in the crowd. You know, that's why the Israelite people organized into tribes. It's what the book of Numbers is all about, telling us that the Israelite people organized into tribes so that no voice, no voice would be lost in the crowd. Not only that, if freedom is a journey toward a common goal, that means that the citizens of a society have to voluntarily, voluntarily submit themselves to a group of laws and customs that enable diverse kind, diverse people to live together in civility. If freedom is a journey toward a common goal that will benefit us all, the demand is made of us as citizens that we think of ourselves not as individuals, but of part of the group. Not as individuals, but as part of the group. Not only that, if uh, freedom is to be a journey toward a common goal, it is demanded of our society that we use citizens in a creative way that allows every person to express their gift so that we can reach the common goal. But you know, and I know, that the story of Exodus doesn't end with just defining freedom. One of the things that the story of the Exodus does for us on the 4th of July weekend is to speak to us about some of the roadblocks that uh, the Hebrew people encountered on their journey to freedom. And some of those roadblocks are still with us. And some of those roadblocks prevented some of the Hebrew people from ever being able to participate in the common goal of reaching the promised land. One of those roadblocks to freedom is fear, living in fear. And you know how that played out for the Israelite people. You know how fear first showed itself for the Hebrew people. They'd left Egypt. They were on their way to the promised land. When they looked behind them, and you know what they saw back there? They saw Pharaoh's soldiers, Pharaoh's armies chasing them. And Pharaoh's armies chased them right smack up against the Red Sea where there was no place to go. And they thought, they thought they were going to die. They said to Moses, why in the world did you bring us out here to die in this godforsaken place? Did you bring us out here because there weren't any graves in which we could be buried in Egypt? What'd you bring us out here for? And then their fear, their fear 
made some of them say, we ought to turn around and go back. Their fear made some of them say, let's go back to slavery in Egypt. It's better than dying. It wasn't so bad. Let's go back to slavery. Whenever fear holds us in its grip, the backward look always has an appeal. When we're held within the grip of fear, we always wish we could go back to a time when things were simpler. Back to a time when we knew what was expected of us and we had some idea of what it is we ought to do. But here's the thing the Exodus story teaches us. The backward look only leads to slavery. The backward look only leads to slavery. For freedom requires that we face our fear straight on and move ahead to the future. Even, even, in those moments when it appears to us that moving ahead will mean drowning in the raging sea. You have to move ahead or you lose freedom. I suppose that that is why almost all of the biblical writers from Genesis clear to Revelation say to us, don't be afraid. For those writers understand that one of the greatest obstacles to freedom is fear. Fear that the dream is impossible. But the book of Exodus, the Exodus story, doesn't stop with simply its story of fear. There's another roadblock that it tells us about, and this roadblock is a cousin to fear. It's the roadblock of anger. Anger and fear go hand in hand. And when we read the Exodus story, it seems to me we see the anger show itself most clearly in their leader, in Moses. Perhaps you remember how Moses behaved when he came down from the top of Mount Sinai where he'd received the Ten Commandments and got down there and saw the way that which the, the uh, Hebrew people were behaving. Remember what he did? He took those tablets on which the Ten Commandments were written and threw them on the ground. And they broke into pieces. And the very foundation of the Hebrews' freedom lay there in pieces at Moses' feet because of his anger. But that wasn't the only time he was angry. Do you remember? When they got out there in the wilderness and there wasn't anything to drink and the Hebrew people began complaining bitterly to Moses about the fact that there was no water for them to drink, it just made him madder than heck. He was mad because he thought, you know, God brought you through the Red Sea. God provided manna for you when you were hungry. Why don't you believe that God will provide water for you when you're, when you're thirsty? It made him so angry, so angry, that he completely blew the instructions that God gave him for providing water for the Hebrew, for the Hebrew people. You know why the book of Exodus tells us about the anger of Moses? One reason is because it wants us to understand that an angry leader can never lead a people to freedom. An angry leader only leads to more angry people. And the truth of the matter is that the greatest obstacle to freedom, the greatest roadblock there is to freedom is the combination of a fearful people 
and an angry leader. It just cannot bring freedom. And so perhaps the best way for us to end our time together this morning is to simply hear the words of a well-known preacher and author by, author by the name of Frederick Beekner. Listen to these words. Of the seven deadly sins, anger is possibly the most fun. <laughs> to lick your wounds, to smack your lips over grievances long past, to roll over your tongue the prospect of bitter confrontations still to come, to savor the last toothsome morsel both of the pain you are given and the pain you are giving back. In many ways, it's a feast fit for a king. The chief drawback is that what you are wolfing down is yourself the skeleton at the feast is you. Let us pray. God send us leaders whose aim will be not to defend some ancient creed, but to live out the ways of Christ in every thought and word. Indeed. Amen.